Like that. Hello. Welcome, everybody, to Grand Rounds. My name's Tom Farden. I'm the chair of this compact Bijou Grand Round. Hello to Perth. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> it lives. <laughs> right, so thanks very much for coming. We're drawing to the end of our Grand Round program. The, this is the penultimate Grand Round. Uh, next week, uh, we have uh, our speciality doctors uh, have asked for a slot to talk about the speciality training program. Hopefully we'll be able to get that program around the junior doctors and doctors in training who they might be interested in that kind of thing. I'll speak to the deanery. I understand that uh, quite a few of the trainees didn't get the emails this week, so I will keep pushing on that front. Uh, we, continue, we have a break after next week until the 14th of September, which is the first grand round of the next academic year. And we're very lucky to have uh, visiting speakers from Oxford University, they, they're from the GI department, and they're going to come and talk about their experiences with small bowel transplants, which is amazing. Um, I've never, uh, I don't know anything about that at all, so it'll be fantastic to hear about small bowel transplants. Um, we have secured a small but significant budget for Grand Rounds now, which means we can invite guest speakers from far afield and pay them uh, for their transport and put them up in a hotel and give them a, a small speaker fee. So if you are watching this on the video or you're in the audience just now and you know of a speaker that you'd like to invite but uh, never could because of lack of funding, we now have that funding. So please speak to me, email me, drop me a line, etc. And we'll see if we can fund an external speaker to come along, which means we hopefully will have a far more varied, interesting Grand Round uh, program moving forward from September. Right, so this week, uh, am I handing over to you, Sarah? Are you going to introduce things? We're just going to carry straight on. Sarah is going to introduce this via me uh, <laughs> from over there. Um, found the foundation program includes academic training posts where the foundation doctors spend some time, most of the time on the wards, but then they have one block in the two years where they focus specifically on academic issues and they are expected to provide uh, a, a body of academic work and they are going to come and speak to us today about their findings and uh, I don't know who's speaking first. Ryan's going to speak first and there's an interesting first slide of something to do with extraction and emergency services and presumably that's what you're going to talk about. Excellent. I apologise that I have to leave um, after about 10-15 minutes so Sarah's going to finish things off. Believe it or not, I'm going down to Carhead to bronchoscope cadavers. That's how weird my life is. So, um, so I apologise for not staying but I will watch it on the video. So uh, I'm still watching, Ryan. Always watching. <laughs> so I just... Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ryan, as Tom's introduced me. I'm a foundation doctor in a and &E at the minute. Um, the majority of my time is spent in academic work, but I do a day a week of clinical work. So this is the project I've been doing for the past 12 months, really. Um, and I thought this picture would just kind of set the scene. So you can see this is a, a car that's left the road. It's in a somewhat rural location. There's a doctor involved, there's a paramedic involved, and there's a couple of different services. So. My project's based around rural trauma and the rural trauma system as it's developing in Scotland. So, that is my grandiose title, uh, The Barriers and Enablers Towards a Developing Rural Trauma System. And you might have heard a few weeks ago from Mr Johnson when he gave his talk at the Trauma Symposium here uh, about the developing trauma system in Scotland. So, from my point of view, I've done a, a qualitative study on different practitioners around Scotland, and that's what I'm going to go through today. I promise there won't be any gory pictures as you're eating your lunch. Okay, so the frame of my talk will be just based around the introduction, the aim of what I've done, how I've done about it, um, brief results, I get a lot of results with this qualitative data, um, I've just picked out a few, and then just a brief discussion as well. Okay, so why did I need to do this project? So, principally because major trauma is a developing disease, really. Um, it's an injury severity score defined as greater than 15. That really doesn't probably mean a lot to a lot of people, but essentially it's a lot of injuries together. Okay. That Could you move a little bit to that side? We can't see you. There you go. Good. Essentially, um, major trauma is multiple injuries that result in a, a systemic response. Um, and in, in Scotland, there's actually quite a decent burden. So the way they manage this around the world, there's obviously a clinical aspect and there's a logistical 
uh, system-based aspect as well. And the development trauma system in Scotland is based around an inclusive trauma system. So what that means is that all acute care hospitals are involved in the trauma system as opposed to an exclusive one which just would have one or two major trauma centres like the one in London. Um, inclusive systems are much better for the most severely injured and the most inclusive systems have a much lower mortality um, as shown in studies across the states in Canada. Um, there are some specific challenges in rural locations. So colleagues in America, Canada, Scandinavia, Australia, they all face these similar problems. So you can imagine if you were in that car crash and you've left the road, it might take a while for somebody to find you. It might take a while for you to get to a hospital or to get to any kind of medical care. And with that, sometimes there's certainly a, an increase in the severity of injury seen by the time they get to hospital. And then also, there's probably a much, there are much rarer sites in rural locations. So although they can be more severe, we don't see as many of them, partly due to population and partly due to the actual patient demographics. Okay, and the plans for Scotland. So, um, the Chief Medical Officer in Scotland, along with regional directors for the major trauma system, Mr Johnson is our one, um, have given us this lovely uh, spider diagram, which says an awful lot, but doesn't mention anything about rural trauma or how things are going to happen, how things are going to work when it comes to these people who live out in the sticks. And 15% of the trauma in Scotland does happen in rural locations. Roughly double the mortality is seen in rural locations over urban populations as well. So I think it's uh, of prime importance that rural populations are given uh, a, good, a good appreciation of what's actually going to happen when this major trauma system comes in. So essentially this is my aim to go out, speak to some people, find out what they thought the barriers and enablers to an efficient trauma system was, and then feed this back into the literature. So how did I go about it? So there's a few qualitative terms here. Um, so it was a proposive sample as opposed to a random sample. So across the breadth of rural hospital practitioners, I picked out individuals that I thought would give me a good spread of the population. So I picked out surgeons and anaesthetists and nurses and managers, ones from each different hospital and different people with different amounts of experience as well, coming from different backgrounds. So it's not just a random sample of the people who I get in. It was across six rural general hospitals. So the Scottish Government defined these as the little red dots on the map. So Oban, Fort William, Wick on the mainland, and then the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland. And each of these come with their different challenges that's inherent to either being off on an island four hours away from the largest city, um, for instance. So how I went about things was through semi-structured interviews. So that's essentially not, not a question-answer checklist. It's a bit more of a fluid guide to what we talk about. So with my three supervisors, um, one is a, a trauma surgeon, one is a social scientist, and then one is a trauma system director. So they all, all bring their different insights, and through them we develop this topic guide um, to go off and speak to the people in the rural locations and get a, a bit of a more structured approach to how how they feel about things. Um, if somebody wanted to talk about one aspect, we could definitely talk about that as opposed to the other questions. So I didn't ask every single person every single question. So this is just a bit of a schematic to show how my data collection and data analysis worked. They, they kind of happened in tandem. So once I developed the topic guide, at the same kind of time I, I was coding the pilot interviews and developing this analytical framework. And essentially that analytical framework was just a series of headings that I developed from the initial interview to ha hang off the different phrases. Um, and I'll, I'll show you those in a minute. And then from all of this, essentially what I was still in out was these key barriers and enablers, the beliefs and expectations of these people 
going forwards of how this is going to affect them and how they think the trauma system should be developed. So, my results. I conducted 15 interviews um, among 18 participants. So there were some group interviews, there were some on the telephone, there were some in people's offices, there were some in people's homes. Um, and from this I've got 34 key barriers and enablers. I had a good breadth of surgeons and ethicists. I had eight of each. I had a nurse, I had a manager um, who was the same person essentially, and a pre-hospital physician as well. And these three themes at the bottom, so patient management, interfaces with the network, and trauma within the wider healthcare system, they're essentially that thematic analytical framework that I'm hanging each of my codes off. Um, for my results, I've distilled things down a little bit. I'm not going to spiel about the t all 34 different statements. I've just picked out the key ones that I think are more relevant, and we can talk about those today. So, for the patient management point of view, everybody was actually quite positive to begin with, um, which is reassuring, I guess. They had a good interaction across this breadth of different agencies. So, you've got mountain rescue teams, you've got the emergency medical retrieval service, you've got GPs as well, the Scottish Ambulance Service. There's lots of people feeding in to the, to the patient management of these rural trauma patients. And I think they all, they all said they, they work quite well together, which is good. However, there were, there were some difficulties along the patient management process. So there's no proper definition of what a rural hospital should provide to trauma patients. So if you get admitted to a hospital in Orkney, you might get a different treatment as to somebody who gets admitted in Fort William. Um, you might get a different type of surgery. They might keep you for a little bit longer before they fly you out somewhere else. And obviously there's, there's difficulties with the individual specifics with the different hospitals, but certainly I, I kind of find there's no proper definition of what they need to provide necessarily. I think the most important thing to note was that the, the referral process into the tertiary hospitals was probably the most difficult thing for these people. Trying to get the patient they have in front of them uh, down to a major trauma centre, whether that's Aberdeen, Dundee, Glasgow or Edinburgh, it was a difficult process. They had to ring around the houses effectively, calling ICU, calling general surgery, speaking to everybody to see who's actually going to take their patient when they get passed from pillar to post. And leading on from that, the interfaces with the network, the single thing that they really wanted was a single point of contact within the major trauma system. So somebody they could call in either centrally for the major trauma system or within each major trauma center that they could just tell them what's happened to this patient, what they, what they need to do, and that they're getting in a helicopter now and they'll be on their way. Um, just about making the system a bit more efficient and a bit more effective and flowing through a bit more quickly rather than these rural hospitals having to hang on to patients. And I think that that goes along the lines of what the major trauma system wants to affect. There was, however, a, a lack of change um, perceived by these different people. They, did, they didn't think that the trauma system was going to help necessarily. Um, they thought that this was something that was being developed in all these big cities and it wasn't going to change what they were going to do day to day. So, sounds a bit disheartening, if, especially because there's so much literature out there to say that trauma systems are good, especially inclusive trauma systems. However, these people just re weren't really engaged whatsoever. And then finally, so trauma in the, the wider healthcare system. So these these things aren't just about the trauma system. These are generic challenges that rural people face and rural practitioners face. So there's only one surgical, rural surgical fellow in Scotland. The, rural, the surgical trainees, the anaesthetic trainees, they don't spend an awful lot of time out in these hospitals. They come through their training and they don't understand what it's like to work in these settings. And I think that was the main problem with referring into uh, a major city. They, they don't know what they've got out there. They don't know that they only have a CT scanner in 9 to 5. They don't have surgeons from all the different specialties. There's one person to deal with it all. And then with that, alongside things, goes the staffing difficulties in all the rural hospitals. That's just recruiting and retention. Um, some of the hospitals, they don't have substantive surgeons. They don't have substantive anaesthetists. They're running on locums the whole of the time and it's incredibly difficult to work like that. There's a complete lack of continuity, especially when you're trying to engage with 
uh, a new protocol or, or a new system that's coming in. So in, in summary, my main findings essentially were that these people are having great difficulties in referring and transporting patients down to the major trauma centre. There are certain things that affect that, that we can't change the distance, we can't change that. We can't change the weather that they face, but we could change the type of transport they get and the referral process and make things a little bit more slick. Um, the other challenges that they have are the way that they, they've engaged with the system thus far. They don't think that this is going to work. They don't think that patient care is going to improve whatsoever. Um, and I think there needs to be a bit more time spent with these people to put a good spin on things and show them how things could develop into a more positive system. And then the more generic things like staffing, like training, that just impact an effective major trauma system being introduced because they don't have the people there on the ground. Specific strengths and weaknesses. I think because I was a, a, I'm a trainee in A&E at the minute, I think I had a good engagement with the senior clinicians. I think people tended to want to speak to me a bit more than if I was an independent researcher. I think with that, I understood the different terms that they were using and allowed the interviews to flow a lot better as opposed to being just a social scientist coming from the outside. I also think that the telephone interviews actually worked really well. So it's kind of difficult not speaking to somebody face to face, but it makes it a lot easier and a lot more time efficient if I can call the people out in the islands and I don't need to go out there, wait around until they're free for half an hour to speak to them. However, there are, there are some weaknesses as well. So there's the bias in the sense that an experimenter bias. I was the only one to do the interviews. I was the only one to produce this topic guide along with my supervisors. And I, I might have led people into certain questions. That was avoided by introducing this with subject matter, subject matter experts to discuss what, they, what the question is going to be. So I wasn't leading. Um, there's also an inherent bias to the people who want to be engaged with this kind of study. There's going to be a lot of people with an axe to grind out there that they feel that their views haven't been listened to in the past. And I think with that, you get a lot of people who might have positive views of the system that feel that they don't, they don't need to mention their views because things are going well and they don't need to engage with this study. And then also the problem with my, my limited study numbers really. So it's kind of limited by time in the sense that I had only four months to do the data collection and write things up and I couldn't go across and interview absolutely everybody so I was limited to just the hospital practitioners and even a smaller subset of that. Plans for the future, I think it's worthwhile repeating this when the trauma system gets up and running to make sure that we've addressed each of these issues and to make sure that there's, there's nothing else has come on the scene that we've missed. Um, and alongside that, I think it's probably worth widening it out a little bit to speak to general practitioners, pre-hospital physicians, um, the public, and possibly MPs even as well, because they're all stakeholders in this trauma system. So in summary, effectively, I'd like to thank Professor Brown and Professor Dillon for mentoring me through the Academic Foundation Programme. I'd like to thank um, my supervisors, Zoe Morrison, Elaine Cole, and Jan Janssen, um, for helping me with my project. And hopefully uh, this will be published in the next couple of weeks to months and it forms the basis of my master's uh, dissertation so all that's out of the way now thank you very much um, yeah that's okay so does, that, does anybody anybody have any questions yeah So just for Perth, the question was, was there any input from Scottish universities? So the University of London, that's where my master's is through. So I've been working over the past two years, and this is the dissertation. Um, one of my supervisors for, was from London. Um, the other two were from Aberdeen. So uh, Zoe Morrison and Jan Janssen, they are both doctors who, who work up in Aberdeen. So Jan particularly is well-versed in the trauma system in Scotland and the developments with that. Yeah, certainly, I've actually, I didn't know anybody before I went out and interviewed them. I didn't interview anybody who I knew personally. Um, 
However, I, I did develop a bit of relationships with each of the people individually um, as I went around the houses effectively. And it was nice to speak to, to colleagues who work in the same system, um, albeit at a, a different end of the spectrum. Any other questions? So I had a question. You mentioned you're hoping for this to be published in the next few weeks. Um, I mean, this sort of information is useful, and what you found out sounds very valuable. So how, how is that going to be released to the people that need that information, and how will it be put into practice? So I'm, I don't have any uh, need to show this to the, the major trauma system necessarily. I'm going to publish it just in the general literature, hopefully in the Journal of Trauma. Um, I, I'm not involved with the development of the major trauma system individually or my supervisors. However, I, I hope that it will be fed back through them. Certainly, my colleagues in a &E are quite involved with the developments in the east of Scotland and around the different regions. Um, but there isn't any specific forum for the public to, to feed into the major trauma system and give their views as yet, unfortunately. It's a shame. It seems like it should be. I mean, it's very specific information that you have. Yeah. Um, well, it was no more evident than when we had the trauma symposium a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we had a couple of surgeons up from the central belt, and they were just on send the whole time and giving us the what for effectively of what's going to happen. But there wasn't a lot of engagement necessarily with people on the ground as to questioning things and how are things going to develop. It seems to be worked out all at the higher levels above my pay grade. Interesting. Okay, well, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. So we'll hand over to the next um, representative of our AFPs, Owen. I'm going to find your talk. Oh, it's all right. Oh, looks like it's... Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, a bit... All right. Hey, yeah. Uh... Nice to see you. My name's uh, Owen. I'm on the um, FY2, so I currently spend most of my time living in AMU at the moment, and that's where I've been confined for the four, past four months. Uh, but before that, I did a project with um, Karis Marwick looking at Clostridium difficile, specifically at ribotype 078. So it's maybe a little bit more dull and a bit drier than Ryan's talk on trauma around um, Scotland, but it's something I actually found really, really interesting to do. So just a little bit of a, a basic introduction about C. diff and what it is. So I know all of you are probably from medical backgrounds, but C. diff is gram-positive spore-forming amaro. It's one of the leading causes of diarrheal associated illness and really it came to the headlines in the 2000s when it caused massive outbreaks, especially down in the south of England but also in Scotland, in the US and across Europe, um, causing large amounts of mortality and morbidity. Um, specifically that was all around the appearance of a specific ribotype called O27 uh, which happened to have a high fluoroquinolone resistance and was highly associated with very poor outcomes uh, and was well reported in the media and has led to many British health, uh, English health boards especially being fined significant amounts of money. Um, over time and with research though, it has declined thanks to good antimicrobial stewardship which has now become a flagship of uh, most NHS trusts, um, surveillance networks and better infection control measures. So these are the kind of headlines that we were seeing after C. diff began to become prevalent. It was first described back in 1978 as a form of pseudomembrous colitis, uh, but this is when it really came to the forefront and came to the media's attention and therefore more money was put into its research and its background at that time. So the good thing is, as you can see, since about 2007, this is information from Health Protection Scotland, which is the, one of the main surveillance networks in Scotland for looking at Clostridium difficile, is that we've reduced numbers with these good techniques, with better antimicrobial stewardship, with good uh, infection control measures. But as you can see, it's still there. We haven't completely eradicated it or completely prevented it. And what we've found recently is certain ribotypes have become more prevalent, one of these of which is in Scotland and also in the Netherlands is ribotype 078, which is what I focus my project on. The aim of my project was to evaluate the use of 
bacterial whole genome sequence data linked to electronic health records to confirm or refute the possibility of C. diff uh, transmission events within hospital, outside of hospital as well in the community. And really, I looked at 078 because it was an emerging hypervirulent strain which is causing more of a burden on the Scottish system at the moment to see whether there were true transmission events. So the methods, I was quite lucky in that there's already, I had access to a larger uh, a selection of clinical strains of ribotype 078 which were for a larger C. diff uh, whole genome sequence study which were all obtained through the Scottish Microbiology Reference Lab between 2007 and 2014. The sequencing was all undertaken in the University Glasgow Polyomics facility and um, I'm not going to go into details about exactly how that was done mainly because I'm not an expert in that field at all. Uh, and I wouldn't want to do it any injustice. This was all linked to electronic health records, so data that was freely available, uh, routinely collected data, and constructed from existing databases on IDRIS, ECOS, and HIC, and then that information was integrated and stored within the Health Informatics Centre safe haven, so it was all secure and anonymised data. In total, we had 105 ribotype 078 samples from 102 different individuals in the final analysis and all the data governance issues were in place already for the larger project and this was basically a tag along to that. Um, so the genomes were compared between the samples, those of less than 10 single nucleotide variants, so differences in base pairs, were considered to be potentially related and those with less than two were almost certainly related, and that's data that has been already collected from a large prospective study done down in Oxford. Um, and yeah, epidemiological data was then analysed. So I took every single event where this person had been into hospital and where there had been a potential sample and transmission, and compared it with every single one of the other people's transmission events and their time in hospital their time in certain postcodes, time in GP practices, to see whether there were any links where there were potential transmission events that had occurred. And these analyses were then done uh, and carried out using SAS 9.4, R, and STATA 14 to really analyse and data crunch that data because it was a significant amount of data and took a long time, two days, three days for some of the analyses to run uh, for that. So looking at what I actually found from um, the uh, analysis was that in the ribotype 078, it had classically been described as affecting a more of an atypical population in younger people with more community-acquired exposure um, and people who had less exposure to common things like antibiotics and PPIs. What I found from the Scottish data was actually it was affecting, for us, it was affecting a, an older population, although there were some younger people involved, the youngest being 21. Um, mortality was relatively high uh, it, within 30 days at about 25%. Uh, and there was a mild association with um, uh, antibiotics. It's not a st this isn't a statistical association, but as you can see from here, about 50% had antibiotic exposure before <laughs> developing infection. So not quite as linked as in some of the other studies. Uh, association was mainly found to be healthcare associated, so that's people who were coming into hospital, having been in hospital for more than 48 hours and then developing uh, a positive sample, basically. Um, looking at the genetic diversity of 0708 through Scotland between 2007 and 2014, shows that 0708 uh, was quite variable uh, and quite diverse, and this was also um, found in specific, even if you took samples from a specific time point in specific areas, there was a large diversity uh, in variation. C. diff has been found to have a, a, a mutation rate of about, as they say, about 10 um, single node variants within 3.8 years is what um, uh, previous research has found. So it's found to be a quite a slow evolving um, bacteria in that respect. Um, potential transmission events. So this is really 
the crux of what um, I wanted to, to go into. So those with less than, well, between zero and two um, differences in the single nu nucleotide variants, there, were only one, there was only one sample that I found to have that, where there was a link for direct, um, direct transmission. So that's them in being in the same hospital at the same time in the same place. Now, if we were to take ribotype alone, which is the most commonly used uh, initial method to identify C. diff transmissions, you see that we're getting 17 uh, possible transmission events. So this is two which are almost certainly going to be related, but if we only take ribotype alone, there's a potential that we might be overestimating possible transmission events within hospital. Um, again, there's further information down here with regard to indirect contact, which basically means that they were in the same hospital, however there was a time gap between the time in which they came in, and that was 28 days, uh, and again that's found from previous research to be a, roughly the amount of time spores may remain, um, postcode area links as well, GP practice, and also geographical code. But one of the things that was most distinctive from, what I, um, from my data was that if you take ribotype alone and you don't take into the fact that there might be variations within the core genome itself in the relationship of these C. diff uh, molecule, um, bacteria, um, then you might be overestimating its actual burden of direct transmission. So, as I already said, there was only one direct transmission event for direct contact, so that's being in the same hospital at the same time. Representing, taking just ribotype alone, we are possibly greatly overestimating the actual amount of direct transmission of C. diff. This is more important, well, this is important in Scotland for health, um, uh, health uh, pr uh, for infection control purposes, but is even more important down in England where health boards are fined based upon C. diff infection, especially if there's a transmission within their hospital. Uh, there's relatively large genetic variation within 078 within Scotland which suggests that there's other reservoirs um, which we need to find out about. Where is this all coming from? And the majority of samples were um, genetically distinct um, from each other. So it's not one outbreak strain we're looking at, but probably more uh, a large variety. And how we go about combating that in the future is, is of interest. There were limitations to the study Namely, it was a small sample size. There's only 105 ribotype 078 samples included over quite a large time span, over seven years. Um, it would be more accurate to use, and this should be a good piece of future work, would be to organise a prospective study, um, and that would enable the more accurate identification of transmission of ribotype 078 within Scotland and also help us identify exactly what its burden is at the moment within Scotland and help us develop uh, new techniques by which to protect against it. Um, the conclusions from, what I'd, uh, from my study were that whole genome sequencing can be applied to routinely collected data. So importantly, these were all uh, clinical strains that had already been collected and were all stored in the Scottish Microbiological uh, Reference Laboratory that we might be using, we might be overrepresenting um, C. diff infection and outbreak if we're only using ribotype alone. And that if we use whole genome sequencing to identify possible outbreaks then, and use it more rapidly and quicker, then we'll be able to more accurately, accurately identify outbreaks and put measures in place by which to stop them. Now, whole genome sequencing is something that is coming down in price and cost um, compared to 10 years ago, and that's going to continue to be the case. Um, it's not to say that every single sample should undergo whole genome sequencing, but if ribotypes are used initially to identify possible samples, and then whole genome sequencing used after um, to identify those in high-risk transmission cases, then that would help identify that possibility. So, well, 
Thanks very much. Um, my supervisor was Karis Marwick, and I worked with uh, Nikosha D'Souza out in the. Um, yeah, she helped me do a lot of the data analysis and the, the programming for the data analysis. Um, and I'd also like to thank Prof Brown for supporting us through all of this. Okay. Has anyone got any questions? Interesting. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, there at the back. If you just shout out. So, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, specifically. Um, O27 was found to be a very severe form of C. diff and O78 as well from its, the research done on that is, has also been found to be a hypervirulent and severe strain. Um, research is currently shown that specifically the specific toxins that it produces, toxin A, B and a binary toxin, uh, might be linked in with its severity. Uh, and that's again why it's of importance to specifically looking at O78 because it's a severe and Increasing pre increasingly prevalent uh, form of uh, C. diff, similar to that which was found in 027 back in the 2000s. And you mentioned the mortality of 24.8%, which is pretty scary, especially with the age range you're talking about. We're down to somebody in their 20s. I mean, what was the? Did you look at the the cause of mortality? Is it? Um, so I, it's, a, yeah. <laughs> it's it's difficult to. Um, that data from the routinely collected data, the health informatics data, it wasn't, you couldn't definitively say that the C. diff had been the cause of the mortality, whether this was from other people of elderly people or with high other morbidities and causes of old mortality. It was just that it, the C. diff samples had been within 30 days of them, um, of them dying. So you always wonder if it's the frailty of the person making them more predisposed to C. diff or if it's the C. diff adding to the frailty. frailty. It's probably both directions, isn't it? Okay, any other questions? I had another question. So you found this, you know, from the detailed sequencing, it seems really a rare event to get direct transmission. So then what is your hypothesis for how C. diff is spreading in the population? How do you get outbreaks if it's not, you know, directly from one person to another? So there's been a lot of research into looking at environmental sources of C. diff and reservoirs, specifically within uh, livestock. And, food, uh, and foodstuffs, so pigs and cattle have been particularly found to have very high levels of um, C. diff and specifically 078 in the Netherlands they found a large proportion of cattle and pigs had genetically related 078 samples within them and whether this is the cause and transmission into uh, humans that's the, a question that needs to be answered. Um, there have been a few studies looking at that transmission effect um, I don't think they've, I can't remember off the top of my head what exactly the, the findings were of that. Actual direct transmission on the, the much larger Oxford study, uh, which was done prospectively, found that direct transmission only really accounted for 20% of um, C. diff infections. Um, so 80% of them are not caused by direct contact, is what they found. Um, is that coming from these reservoirs within the community? I think that's a question that's yet to be answered and how do we go about thinking about stopping that then transmission is another thing that needs to be looked into. And what about the lack of association with antibiotics? Because that was very well established in the early days but it doesn't look like that from the... Yeah, early yeah. so again it's looking at these other factors that might be contributing into um, what exactly is happening. I don't think from my data and my analysis I could conclude exactly why these specific people are developing in. Is it through frailty? Uh, is it through another morbid state, um, which is then perpetuating and potentially uh, allowing these infections to come to, to light? Um, again, that's something I think we need to, to look into because C. diff has the possibility, and we've already seen in the past, um, uh, the ability to cause large amounts of issues within the hospital, uh, within the healthcare system, and um, stopping its spread is, is is quite key. 
It's surprisingly mysterious, given that, I mean, we like to think we're on top of infectious diseases within, you know, such a modern healthcare setting, but clearly we're not on top of this infectious disease, are we? Yeah, but I think, I think the good thing is, from Health Protection Scotland, it shows that we have reduced its burden significantly yeah. through just a few s- simple techniques, like controlling which antibiotic you use, being cautious about concurrent use of a PPI, uh, especially within the elderly. Good hand-washing techniques and cleaning uh, has also led to good reductions, and also the surveillance as well from Health Protection Scotland in identifying areas of outbreak has all helped reduced its burden and it's we probably will never eradicate it completely but it's always good to look at other means by which to, to reduce its burden within our system great okay so no more burning questions so it just leaves me to thank our, t- our two um afps who've spoken to us today and uh, thank you all for coming along Yeah. So you def- yeah, there was a lot because that yeah, I was a junior doctor in the sort of like eighties, early nineties, and C diff then was like this mysterious yeah. illness that t- killed your patients basically, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's still. I don't know. Then the story was fairly clear cut that if you ever use antibiotics, it allows C diff to overgrow, and we used yeah. to feed our patients brew- brewers yeast to try and oh right yeah reset the microbiome. Is that yeah. still thought to be? But they do things like fecal transplanting and stuff like that has become a. Did they actually do that in an NHS hospital for an elderly patient. Yeah. They weren't really. Well, I think there's. Um, it's not I've actually time. I've got a I've got a, I've got a friend who. Or I've got a friend who knows another person who has recently started a company which is purely around fecal transplanting. Um, it's hard to and market. It's hard to market. They've just had a big investment of, over, I think it's up to over a million pounds. This wasn't a guy in Aberdeen, was it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, don't, I don't know him personally, but he's a medical student, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's something that they think if you replace the... Yeah, the microbiome. The microbiome within the gut. Yeah. Do you potentially alleviate some of the symptoms and uh, to be honest it's had really <laughs> positive results so you know, for, uh, um, yeah, for lots of different I think uh, it's been a lot of different things yeah, yeah, C. diff was one of the ones that the gut microbiome for atopic illness and this interplay between the immune system of the gut and skin and mm. lungs it's mm. uh, you can't com- compartmentalise stuff like we used to mm. in a simplistic way of thinking mm. yeah I think there's a lot of work out of some of the labs in Aberdeen about that kind of thing. It's so complex, yeah. that's the trouble. And the, a lot of it's kind of time dependent as well. Like, what age yeah. in your life do you establish your microbiome? It's pretty yeah. early. So then, if you change your microbiome when you're in your 80s, what, what you know, that's going to have a different effect, effect than if you have yeah. change it in your 20s or change it when you're first born. It's very, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Great, but your stuff, that's a real shame. It's not getting fed back to the national. Not like, that's directly. I guess it will still go out. But it is just like these guys are sorting it from the top, and yes, yeah, it's, it's disappointing um, that that occurs. Really, there's a bit of there's a bit of politics. let's say loggerset, loggerheads, yeah, politics yeah. between my supervisor and the kind of fence he sits on, and the rest of yeah. the yeah. So yeah. He, he sides with the literature, and everybody else sides with. What they want to do. Mm-hmm. What they, they yeah. Yeah. The pragmatic approach or the yeah, swashbuckling, I know best. Which is it's essentially because they're just going to lose their trauma workload in Dundee okay. if they went about it the right way. Yeah. But, uh, that sort of protectionist thinking. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's not for the best of the population. It's, I think r- rurally there hasn't been anything written as yet. Yeah. So it should, hopefully, it will feed into it. How does basics and stuff like that feed into. So that's all, well, that's, that's pre-hospital. Pre-hospital, kind of thing. yeah. Um, I think there's, they certainly have some of those kind of people on the committee. Yeah. Um, but it's all regionalised, so you don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the north is what's going to happen in the west. Yeah. You don't um, need a unified system, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't affect us a huge amount here. Okay. Because there's not a lot of rural spots. Yeah, yeah. This is mostly west coast kind of thing, where they're okay. like, it's it's crazily remote, isn't it? Yeah. And I was sitting next to Tom, and he was saying, "Have you ever been to any of these hospitals? They're like 
there is nobody, there's one doctor who, who no, tries to do everything. Fort, Fort William, they don't have any substantive surgeons or anaesthetists. I mean, it is like the third world. I mean, it, you know, there are regions of Africa and Asia that are the best. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's one true. doctor on call overnight for both the hospital and the A&E. Yeah. So when you get anything that happens, there is a consultant. Oh, there is a consultant on, but yeah, um, there's um, yeah. Basically, it's the junior sees it first of all. It doesn't yeah. matter if it, it could be catastrophic medical issues. It could be, yeah. and there's an anaesthetist on call as well. But yeah, it could be medical. It could be trauma. I remember when I was in Port William, we had a person who'd fallen off, um, fallen climbing in Ben Nevis, and had massive abdominal injury with internal bleeding, fractures to his C spine. Um, and of course they brought him in for stabilisation but then you've got him in your department he's a young guy he's not at all stable he's not stable yeah. he's not going to stabilise until he, he's had yeah, surgery yeah, yeah he needs someone to go in and do he needs a trauma surgeon to fix his abdomen and his whatever he had a splenic laceration and like how do you go about managing that in an area where yeah. you're two hours yeah. tra- or an hour's transfer from Glasgow it, or it Aberdeen really or something you get because you get Fort William had it really good for a while. So then, yeah, they so had Fort William had a lot of trauma surgeons. But then the, the West Coast, like Wick. the Western Isles, Wick. Oh, and yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, Wick, yeah. Or- Orkney worked well. They've got two guys who worked in Africa for a decade or more, and they've done absolutely everything. Yeah. And they've brought all those skills back, but when mm. those guys retire, yeah, there's nothing. no continuity. Yeah. Or and what's the local population think? I mean, do the people realise that they're living in. So, yeah. What, what do they seriously? Yeah. What do they think? I mean, like if you're living there with your family, and there's there's two sides. There's the local people, the like Stornoway, the Western Isles people, who have grown up there all their lives and they just get on with things. Yeah, so people die basically, them. and they just yeah, they just like, like I did my like GP yeah. placement in Harris, and you wouldn't be bothered with people with silly things. But then there's the the white settlers. Like the people who come up from England. There's a lot of English walk. people moving yeah. to beautiful islands on the west coast, yeah, and they and do. They they are yeah. And that's where they go, but then yeah, they, ex- they expect the same, the same standard, standard of care yeah. as they got in London. Yeah. And that just is not feasible. No yeah. Like how you're not going to get a international cardiologist no. like going on. No, <laughs> as far as, yeah, you, you, you don't, don't have any. They'd have to go to <laughs> Inverness or something like that. Is it, yeah, in Inverness they've got. They probably have. I don't know how many, how many one dermatologist in Inverness who's expected to do. Do they travel? They yeah, maybe do their travelling clinics do. where they sort of like mm. travel around. Yeah, they they do often. Our outreach clinics for Colin, yeah. yeah. And there's more tele dermatology nowadays, but it's not good. It's not good. And these guys are getting more and more skin cancers in the north of Scotland because of all the sun exposure and mm. they don't get well managed. So, but yeah. I did look at some telemedicine for that as well. I think that's probably a good avenue you would die. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the way it'll have to be because you get people who. Remote management. I haven't seen these things very yeah. rarely. Yeah. You've got somebody in Glasgow who sees it every day. Yeah. So it's probably better for them to advise. Yeah, mm. even advising on scans and x-rays mm. and stuff in that kind of trauma situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like you, what to do. You always called the orthopedic guy in, yeah, in the nest <laughs> or you called the neurosurgeon in Glasgow. Yeah. But teamwork's the communication line. Very good, very good. So in terms of the AF, the like the, the program of being an AFP, if you guys tell me the truth now that you're leaving. <laughs> I <laughs> like, yeah. I I would apply for it again. Yeah, I, I loved it. Yeah. Seriously. I was a bit uh, I was a bit apprehensive about my four months yeah. when I was on the run up to it. Um, because because I wasn't a hundred percent because it's weird having worked a clinical job where you. Got, this is your rotor. This is what, this doing, is what yeah. you were doing. Yeah, no, a black to time tip, yeah. <laughs> do you need to do stuff, but just get on and yeah, do it yeah. yourself. It's that, that is a, different it's a complete way. different mindset. It's much more adult. Yes. Just, yeah, yeah, that's the bottom line. You're under your own steam, yeah. which is good. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Because I think it's why I picked this job over jobs down south. Okay. Because there were somewhere. In the Midlands or just north of there, they, they had an academic A and E job. And I was like, "Well, I'll go for that," but they wanted me to do traumatic brain injury. Yeah, you have and to do what you they have want. to do what the professor in that department you, yeah. wants. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this was a lot more. Because this was more like hunt around, you're find whoever you're interested in. Doesn't necessarily have to be in mm-hmm. a person in Tayside. 
can be... We try to keep it as flexible as possible. Yeah, and and I, I mean, I, I've good. only taken over this role like a year ago and I kind of inherited that very hands-off role because, you know, John Dillon is very hands-off yeah. Yeah. to the point of total... Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I t- so, I mean, it was, so I kind of inherited a just incredibly yeah. hands-off approach and actually... And I thought, well, I don't know, people either rise to it or they don't. Yeah. But in a way, if you rise to it and, and you, you make your own project, you fill your own mm-hmm. time, then in terms of success in the future in academic medicine, that is absolutely essential. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, your next stage up, there isn't somebody saying, right, I've got a project for yeah, you, you've yeah. got to do this today, this tomorrow, this the next day, right. here's the money. You've got to think of your own project, you've got to apply for your own funding, mm-hmm. you've got to motivate yourself. Certainly. So if you've kind of proven you can do it now. So in terms of writing your CV, that's something always to make clear. I was given a four-month block, and this is how I used it, and I organised yeah. my time because yeah. because you can really get your hand held through it. Yeah, yeah. because a lot of people will. And again, it's something. I mean, I've got friends who trained in London, and in London, it is everything's like that. More you do an MD, it's all organised. You do a PhD, it's all more organised. I trained in Newcastle, where it was, you know, sort yourself out. On. And and at the time, it was really scary, but it stood me in really good stead mm-hmm. as well. That's why I got big welcome trust funding. So it is a kind of a north-south difference, you know, and and. The London people come out very glossy, and often if the professor's given you a good project, you can guarantee it's a good project. So it's safer. Yeah. This way is more risky. You know, you guys have both got great projects and you've succeeded. Mm-hmm. So you get both. Then you guys have got a very good project that you've made yourself. So you've got the experience of making it yourself as well as a good project. I guess what I, I mean, you you know, I'm talking to you too because you're here and you're very successful. Is there anybody like amongst the other group, or the rest of the group? Would you say that there, there are other people that um, that maybe wouldn't tell me, but that have had a found it more challenging or not risen to the challenge or I know Anna's pretty happy. People Anna's. utilise their time differently, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the way of putting it. Okay. Yeah. Some people like I did a big project. Yeah. And some people did lots of smaller ones. Yeah. yeah. But there's nobody and that's kind of dropped split. off the cliff and said I hate this and they're not looking after yeah. me nah. so Well Ewan had a crisis of conscience last year. Ewan Ewan was the only one who and but he left yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think he, but he's. But I think it's, that was more. That was more. Uh, it, that just was everything that was going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was like a lot of. It wasn't just. It wasn't academic. Really. No, it was just everything together. So there's nobody else that's carried on that actually has thought. No, this is. This no. is. No, no, I think okay. everyone's. And looking at the the guys who are coming, the F ones. They all seem to be. They well, the ones that I know. Yeah, they're yeah. Getting, they're gradually are getting projects. Like, are yeah. all fine and Daniel stuff. had a bit of a difficult start trying to pin down supervisors. Oh to yeah, Daniel's player. I think that that was Daniel partly. <laughs> I couldn't discern what was Daniel and what was supervisor. I yeah, think, I think it was a bit of both. I, I think I hear what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, he's a good guy, good guy. And then you've got like Andrew and stuff like that. Andrew's already set with his PhD yeah, and stuff like that. He's yeah, got quite it's a lot. different. Yeah, really. Yeah, Andrew's done a PhD and stuff before. I think he has, hasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a good project. <laughs> he's already been in Men's Health or something like that. He's had an article written about him. It's like a climbing styled one. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Good. Oh, well, it's good to get positive feedback. I just wanted to check there wasn't any kind of undercurrent that. Um, no, I no. think I think when you when you meet the the new the new people, mm-hmm. it's just about this is your own time and it is daunting and stuff like that yeah. but there is literally it is the variety that you can do because yeah. I did half I, I split mine with doing medical education yeah. like doing like a day or so see, a week great to be able to do both. in mm-hmm. there and, and doing my research at the same time was great mm-hmm. so you can there's so many different things did you, did you do your clinical day a week um I did a clinical day I did and a, med a day. I did a med ed day and then I did three days I think you definitely have to do the clinical day. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Because you have to. Because, yeah. Otherwise, you de skill so Well, I, I felt sitting in GP because I had GP before this and then this. If I had done nothing for eight months, it would have been a nightmare coming yeah, back. Yeah. Even coming back after GP to work in A and E was just a bit weird. No, we're very strict about the one day. Yeah. People do often ask to drop it sometimes because they want to go away for you know two months, three months. But we're very, very strict mm. about it's a training requirements. Yeah. So mm. It's not something that we've a rule that we've made up. It's it's unavoidable. I think I was the first one down in A and E, but they yeah. were quite accommodating as yeah, well. Good. Good. To be honest, everyone is really happy. Yeah. Dundee is good at it's good at that, yeah. 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 ID loved yeah, it was great. Yeah, Let me do loads of stuff. So. Andy Patterson was effectively getting a free doctor. So. Yeah, yeah, I know they're always happy because you're like <laughs> supernumerary that. extra yeah, staff extra. that comes in and. Yeah, have other countries published like 
similar no. reports or studies. As far as I can find, it's surprising. It sounds like a really obvious there's not a lot thing of, to look into. There's not a lot of quality of stuff from a trauma point of view, or not a lot of quality of stuff that gets published. Because it's all surgeons and this and I guess they want one to euros and numbers. Um, there is one Canadian study that's similar, but it's not been published yet. They've only put out the protocol um, last year. So I think this is the first one. Thanks. So I think it is probably applicable to Scandinavia, Canada. I suppose a lot of, a lot of countries with a large population mm. don't have the resources to, to finance studies into something like that or, or, or bother to even think about it. There, like, there's certainly a lot of rural trauma data from the states that says, well, rural trauma is worse, rural trauma this and that, but it's all numbers. It's not like a quality of approach to how we can do things, which is what I was kind of going on. Um, so hopefully I will get a point. Why don't you want me to delete that? Uh, yeah, you can do. There you go. Yeah, fingers crossed, thanks. See you later, Yeah. See you later. Can we turn this off? Here we go.